Welcome to the initial broadcast of What Happened on Saturday with Marlon Kerner. My name is Josh Cormier, a former coaching assistant with the Buffalo Bills. I am in the shadow of Touchdown Jesus in my own basement, and I am privileged to be joined by former Ohio State Buckeye and Buffalo Bill Marlon Kerner. Marlon, how you doing? I'm doing well. I'm just so excited to be talking about college football, something that's different and probably needed um, in Bill's country. Um, so looking forward to just having some fun conversations and, and telling some fun stories about my own experiences of Division I football. Absolutely. So, you know, Marlon and I have become friends over the past year talking Bills football and through our mutual acquaintance, Don Purdy, who I do the If the Walls Could Talk in Buffalo podcast with. And, uh, you know, I reached out to Marlon and I thought, what a great idea to kind of expand for the Cover One audience a little bit more on college football, a passion of that, that he and I both share. And Marlon had, you know, an amazing D1 college career and an ultra talented Ohio State team in the 90s, played with amazing teammates, played against, you know, a Hall of Famers, first round draft picks, Super Bowl champions, national champions, et cetera. So we're going to do things a little bit differently here. And we're going to, you know, we're going to have fun telling stories. We're going to mirror the Ohio State and Notre Dame seasons. So let's not forget that, even though the, the background is scarlet and gray. And I think some of our guests will be as well. And Marlon's agreed to uh, humor me on my Notre Dame passion, which maybe I'll explain to, to the audience later on. But he, let's start here, Marlon. Why? Um, why the podcast? Why now? And then maybe you could remind people of your journey from you know high school days all the way to, to, to today. Sure. So why this show? Why this topic? Uh, it's something that I love. I love college football. Uh, probably I might even give watching college football a nod over how much I love watching professional football. I think for me growing up, I understood that when you look at the college football season, like one loss could be detrimental. Um, so every game matters that like you see the passion that goes along into it. Uh, and then having gone to Ohio State and and gone played at some of those large stadiums and, and seeing how ruckus the crowd can get uh, and the paint. And I mean, if you've ever been to an Ohio State game, like you'll walk in, you'll see people with the block goals tattooed here, Buckeye leaves here, half scarlet, half gray faces. So just that atmosphere, just trying to bring that type of experience and help people see what it's like um, to go and play at a stadium where you have hundreds of thousands of people cheering for you on any, any given Saturday. Uh, and then you go to the pro ranks and the, the stadiums are smaller by design, but it's just a totally different experience. And Buffalo is probably as close to a college experience that you'll get um, as a pro team. Uh, and so it's just wanting to show people a different side of what it looks like and really just kind of showing what that experience is. And we have UB here. So that's the closest that we're going to have um, to a division one school. And it's not the same. So helping people understand where UB fits into that spectrum and then giving people another perspective and how our favorite Bills players, the schools they come from, how they get here, what their experiences might be, help shedding light on that. Let's uh, let's do a, a quick tutorial or you know a couple quick questions about Ohio State itself. Um, what's a Buckeye? Um, a Buckeye is a actually realistically it's a poisonous nut. Um, it grows on a okay. Buckeye tree. Um, so if you eat it, you'll die. If you eat too many, you'll die. Um, but uh, we make them with peanut butter and chocolate. Uh, so if you eat those, as long as you're not allergic to peanut butter, you're gonna love a Buckeye. Um, so that is a Buckeye. How did you earn one of the stickers uh, on your helmet? Like so you had to make a good play. Um, so when we did them, you had to do a spec. Like, so when you played on offense, defense, special teams, they would grade you out. So you talk about your plus minuses uh, in a game, any any situation. So depending on how we graded, you would get a buck I leave for how many plus minuses you might have. If you made a big play, like if you get an interception, uh, if you block a field goal, if you if you get a sack, if you score a touchdown, you might get an, an extra buck I leave for that. Uh, and so it was hard to get them. Um, but you had to make sure you played well. And if you didn't play well, they would you didn't get Buckeye leaves that week. So uh, it takes a while to kind of get there. And and that's my helmet from my senior year. Uh, we had some really good plays that year. We ended up being nine and four. So we didn't play up to the best of our potential. Uh, and we had some really close games. We didn't do some things well, but then we played some teams and did some really good things. And so um, that's how I got that helmet full of Buckeye leaves. You got quite a, uh, quite a full helmet behind you there. Yeah, I made some good plays uh, and, and some not so good plays, and and you just kind of that growing, that growth, and that learning experience as an athlete. Um, it was a lot to go through, and I'll definitely share uh, some of those experiences, some of the lessons that I learned uh, that senior year because that was a very trying time for me um, that senior year. But I think I grew, uh, and I ended up learning how to play football and learning why I play football. 
All right. So you've shared a little bit of this with me, but not the full story. So before we, we, we move forward, obviously you must have been a great high school player, track star. Why Ohio State? And tell me why not Notre Dame? So I was a high school quarterback. So believe it or not, um, and, and this goes to the, the question people always ask, do you need to play Little League football to make it to the NFL or to even make it to play college football um, at the Division One level? And I am an example of somebody not playing Little League football all the way through. Like I didn't play organized football until the eighth grade. Um, and it was more due to the fact that financially I came from a single parent home. Um, I have a twin brother. Uh, and so we didn't have a lot of money uh, and we didn't have a vehicle. So it was very difficult for us to say, let's put him in Little League football. So what I did was I went outside and I just worked on my craft. Like I would watch the games. I would figure out how to do it. I would run routes. I would throw the football to myself. It didn't matter for me um, what the temperature was outside. It could be 100 degrees. And my mom, I, I remember so many times my mom was like, it's so hot. You shouldn't be outside. Mom, you think Jerry Rice is not outside practicing in this? I'm outside. I'm going outside. So I would go outside and it didn't matter. 100 degrees by myself, whether my friends wanted to play. Uh, and as a kid coming up, I was very tunnel vision. I only wanted to practice football. That's all I did. I would practice throwing the football. I would practice making my fingers like, you know, pinky to pinky, catching the football. That's all I did. And then about the eighth grade, I played football and I also met a good friend of mine. Um, his name is Ron Cunningham. We called him Buster. Uh, and he loved basketball. And he would always get me to play basketball. And I sucked at basketball because <laughs> like, <laughs> I, all I want to do is play football. And so he's like, you know, you got to be well-rounded. Like you need to play other sports. And so he was the first person who challenged me to play other sports. And so I did. And then I became a different athlete. And so that one year of playing football, I was a running back. And I remember going to the first time of my practice and I put it on pads and they're like, what position do you want to play? Uh, and I went to Gahanna Lincoln. Shout out to Gahanna Lincoln. Um, the Gahanna Lincoln Lions. I went to the Little League football. Um, and that was my first year, my first and only year to organize football. And I was a tailback. And so I remember getting there because I wasn't sure. I just knew I could run really fast. Uh, and so I, we got there and we're running and they're kind of looking at me and we had to run sprints. And so I'm beating this entire team, like just flying by everybody, like 40 yards. Sprint. Okay. I know I'm going to win this sprint gone. I'm like, okay, I can do this. And then everybody was like, okay, you know what? Yeah, you're fast, but wait till um, there was a guy and we became really good friends. His name was Pat Zill. Um, and they were like, wait till Pat gets here. Like, yeah, you might be fast now, but you're not going to be Pat. And so I'm very competitive by nature. And so these kids talking to me at 13 years old, telling me, wait till Pat gets here. They didn't know what Pat, they were unleashing on Pat's head. <laughs> because Poor Pat, right? The first thing that I was thinking like, okay, when Pat get here, Pat is going to get smoked. There is no way I'm letting Pat beat me in any drill. Pat is going to always be second. No matter what I do, we take handoffs. I'm going to do it better than Pat. If we have to run a certain play, I'm going to do it better than Pat. Because everybody was challenging me like, yeah, okay, you're better than us. You're faster than us, but you're not going to be Pat. So I couldn't wait until Pat got there. And Pat was off the entire first week. His family was out on vacation, but he was the man. He was the guy um, that everybody's like, yeah, wait till Pat gets here. And this is my first year. I don't know anything about organized football. Um, I'm trying to figure out, like, how do you take the handoff right? So we get there and I couldn't wait. Like, we're getting there and Pat took all the first team reps. He did all the things. I'm like, okay. I'm waiting for it. And as soon as we light up for 40s, that was it. As soon as he blew that whistle, I took off. Like, that was it. Like, I, and, and ironically, their colors were blue and yellow. Um, <laughs> so I'm in this blue and yellow jersey float. And I mean, I'm flying. And I mean, I tried to make sure in a 40 yard sprint, I was trying to beat him by at least a yard. To, like, and it was nonstop. Every time we lined up, it didn't matter. He was going to lose. And I, I'm pretty certain he lost. To my recollection, Pat might say that's not the case. Yeah. Um, but I'm pretty certain in my mind, he lost every 40. There was no way I was going to let him win it. And so that kind of started my competitive nature. Uh, and we ended up, <laughs> we didn't have that much success that year. Uh, so it was kind of interesting just to kind of watch it. We ended up going, he ended up being a fullback. I ended up being a tailback. We ended up kind of learning how to play with each other. And we became really good friends. And then we split. He went to get Hannah Lincoln. I went to Brookhaven High School um, in Columbus. So totally different area. And first thing I was going to do was play tailback. Um, and I was like, I'm a running back. That's it. And so we get to the drill. We had some really good talent coming up. And we had a guy named Wilbur Brown who was all world um, in Columbus. He rushed for over 5,000 yards, like 50, 50 or 60 touchdowns. He was really good. So I looked at that and I said, there's too many tailbacks here. 
but I can also throw a football um, because I've been practicing it since I was a kid. So I switched to quarterback. And so that started my quarterback journey. Um, and then the rest is history. I just started learning how to play the position, um, ended up starting as a quarterback about halfway through the season. My freshman year, um, wow. finished that, started my sophomore year, um, NJV, and then my junior year. Um, there was some question of should I have been a starter my sophomore year? Uh, and I won't go into why I didn't start. Um, I like to say politics are involved. Um, there's always boosters and things that go along um, into play. But yeah, I think let's, talk, me. let's talk a little <laughs> Ohio football. You know, obviously, Texas football, Texas high school football gets all the rub, all the national publicity, the movies, the TV show, right. Friday Night Lights, the book. When I got uh, hired to the football staff at the Bills, uh, Coach Phillips, his first assignment for me was to read Friday Night Lights because, <laughs> you know, Texas football, all that. He's like, you're going to you're going to learn football one way or another, boy. So can you what are the differences like Ohio football? Is it is it? 10 out of 10 with Texas football? Is it a little less intense? Is it more intense? Is it life? It is life, like Texas football. Um, there are towns uh, in in Columbus, uh, well, actually in Ohio in itself, that actually they shut down on Friday night. So everybody closes at 5, 30, 6 o'clock. Everybody comes out. They go to the football game at night. Uh, we played a team, um, I think my junior year in high school, where the entire town shut down. Um, the bleachers were filled. And then they had a hill overlooking the stadium. And so all you saw were people on blankets. They had picnic baskets. They had lawn chairs. And they were all on this hill watching this football game. Uh, and so that was where you start realizing, like, wait a minute. Like, this is on a whole different level. Football is a way of life, just like it is in Texas. Um, it's the same way in Ohio. Um, when you're old enough and when you're born, you're going to, especially if you're born in Columbus, you're going to get one or two things put into your crib. You're going to either basketball or football, right? Yeah. Um, sometimes people will put a baseball glove in there. Uh, but more importantly, they're more most likely you're going to get a, a Ohio State football. Um, you're going to get something that says, uh, I was uh, my first Ohio State football jersey. All of my kids had them. Um, so when they were born, I, they all had that picture with it um, because football is a way of life. So when I grew up, I don't even remember when I liked football. I just knew from when I was about four years old that I wanted to play football, that I love playing football. Um, it's just, that's the way of life. And that's what we do in Ohio is you like football. Now people are starting to branch out and do other sports. Soccer is now big lacrosse. It's one of those sports, um, hockey. When I grew up, we didn't have hockey. It was either football first, basketball second, track and field third, um, and then baseball, like, kind of like that ranking of tie with third. So when you're in high school and you're the starting quarterback, for a Ohio big time Columbus, Ohio, you know, high school football team. What level of pressure did you feel? Like, was it, was it similar to when you played in Ohio state? Was it similar to no. when you played for the bills? No, it's so not, maybe no, it's not even the same. Um, like for us. So I grew up in the city league. So I grew up in Columbus city. Um, so in Columbus, we, where I come up um, and when I was playing football, we had about 14 or 15 city league schools um, that all played each other. So if you're comparing it to Buffalo, where we are now, that would be like Burgard. Um, okay. That would McKinley. be McKinley. That would be Cleve Hill. That would be those teams that play within the city. So we had a full interleague, um, inner city school, um, and we had a city league. So we had a north and a south. We had all these divisions. We played each other, uh, and we had a full schedule. So we would play 11 games. So I think that was one of the biggest differences of when I moved here to Buffalo and saw how different football is here in Western New York, as opposed to growing up in Ohio. We played a full 11 game schedule. Um, and then you had playoffs or you had your championship, whatever that was going to be. Uh, so growing up in Columbus, you understood that in order to make the playoffs, you had to, we had a computer system. So they had rankings. So you wanted to play teams that were good. Uh, and so we were teams didn't want to play in the city league because if you lost, you didn't get enough computer rankings for them to justify why they would want to play us. So you had to just start being really good. So we were pretty good coming up. Um, we had some really good teams and we won some city championships. And so my junior year is when I started full time um, for the first season uh, and we ended up going 10 and two and we won the city league division and we won, we won, our we won the championship. Uh, and so we came back our senior year and we had to play at school that was the sales. So that was our first Catholic school um, that we wanted to play. And they were literally a block down the road from us. So we were on Carl Road in Columbus, Ohio. Our, my high school is now closed. But the sales um, is a Catholic high school. And it is literally a block away from us. Um, and they're still open. And so that was like the first rivalry that we got to play. We played on my junior year and we lost. We played on my senior year 
and we lost. I hate to say it. <laughs> um, but one of the ties that comes into that is Luke Fickle, who is now the head coach at Wisconsin and ended up being one of my teammates at the Ohio State University, as I have to throw that in. Sure. Um, he was at, we played against him in high school. Um, so that was kind of one of those things where we just had so much talent. Uh, and depending on where you decided to go, you would come across somebody who eventually ended up going and playing football at Ohio State. Now, you told me you had a receiver that anybody who's going to listen to the show <laughs> will obviously know their name. Tell me about throwing to Terry Glenn. So I grew up um, and played football with Terry Glenn. Uh, so being a high school quarterback, uh, Terry blossomed. Uh, Terry was about Terry was a year behind me. So my junior year, he was a sophomore. So he was still trying to figure it out, still growing into his body. But he was really fast. Uh, and so by the time my senior year came along, he was got a guy like, we, we've got to get him on the field. Uh, and he made some unbelievable catches. I, I remember we played a, a school called Beechcroft um, that we beat them a lot. Um, so anybody that went to Beechcroft that might be listening, sorry. Uh, so, <laughs> but he made a catch. He just jumped over somebody. He he did a Randy Moss catch on somebody in high school before that even before Randy Moss was even playing um, in the NFL and mossing people. Um, so he was the first person that mossed somebody in high school that I saw. Um, he was just a phenomenal athlete, and he really blossomed the following year when he became the man. Um, and he was just a guy that just was super fast. Uh, all of us, we ended up running track um, because our football coach was also a track coach. So that's how we ended up getting roped into track. So that's why I love running track as well. Uh, but Terry was just a phenomenal athlete. And then we got to go and play with each other in college um, and then eventually played against each other in the NFL. So it was one of those journeys where you really just get to watch like, man, like we were 15, 16 year old kids talking about, I hope I get the opportunity to play college football. Then we got to play college football with each other. And we're like, I hope I get drafted and just make it to the NFL. And then we're talking to each other. And it's one of those, normally you like to jaw against receivers or maybe talk trash. Like our trash talking wasn't trash talking. It was, oh my gosh, can you believe we were kids yeah. dreaming, dreaming about this? Like, can you believe we were talking about this on the football field when we're 15, 16, about what I'm gonna do when I get to the NFL. And now I'm guarding you, not only in, in college, I got to guard you now in, in, in the NFL. So it was one of those just really cool, surreal moments uh, and so I remember my first year we played him, he got the better of me and I had to go back and like, I need to get better. I got to work on this. I got to work on that. And so we're in the game like, man, Kern, because that was my nickname in high school. Everybody called me Kern. Um, okay. So he's like, I can't believe how good, how much better you got. Like, I can't believe you're doing this. You're doing that. Like, this is pretty amazing. And so it was just one of those really surreal moments where you're just kind of like, oh my gosh, like the growth, the maturity, like what we've been able to accomplish and we've been doing it alongside each other and watching each other's grow um, growth over this course of our entire lifetime. And then, you know, unfortunately, um, you know, where everything just happens to him now and his untimely demise, but I'll never forget just us, just football, just kind of growing up when it was at its purest form. And we were just trying to figure out how we get to the next level and get out of our own environments. You guys grew up together and, uh, you know, ended up in an amazing spot. Who got the better of the reps in the NFL? <laughs> I will say, I think the last game that we played them, they got the better of the score. I think there were moments when I made plays. I'll take the diplomatic. I made plays against at, against him at times, and then he made some really good plays against us, against me at times. And I think that was the fun part. Um, it was not one of those where, oh, my gosh, it's Terry Glenn, where somebody else might be like, oh, my gosh, he's this, he's that. I was just like, this is Terry. I know Terry. Like, So I was never afraid of what this was happening or this person is this or he has this aura about him. It was this is Terry. I've known Terry since I was 15, 16 years old. So I, I know what he does well. I know how he wants to run this route. I know where I need to be um, to get him. And then we're going to see mano y mano who wins. Uh, and he won some plays. I think there was one time I tried to come underneath the ball and Drew Bledsoe threw the ball high. He went up and got it because he was an amazing leaper, um, which a lot of people don't know that about Terry. He had a, a really good vertical, like a 30 inch vertical uh, coming out of college. So I came low knowing that if he throws the ball, low, I'm going to knock it out. He went high, made a great catch. But then Drew Bledsoe threw a deep ball, and I knew where the ball was going to be, and I knew I could run with him. So it was just meet him where the ball is going to be, and I broke up that pass. So it was one of those just fun moments of trying to understand where the ball is going to be, understanding your keys, understanding how you're supposed to play in the scheme of the defense. Uh, and so it was a lot of fun just going up against him. That's amazing. So you, Terry, you know, probably some of your better high school teammates, what does it feel like to know – like that you're just like the best athletes on the field, you know, like when you like in high school and then obviously you're starting to probably get recruited, you know, junior, senior year of high school. Like I've never experienced where I've been the best player on any field I've ever been on. So maybe you could talk to people of what it's like, you know, it's not, it's not arrogance. It's just, 
it's confidence and you know, right. you put the work in and you're athletic and, and you, you, you know what you're doing. What, what does that feel like? I think if, if the coach does it right, um, what the coach is able to do is make sure that you, you kind of help keep people's egos in check. So I think for one, you have to stay really grounded. You have to have some really good friends, right? Cause that's, it's really easy, especially now um, with social media and what's, what's out there. Um, you know, and the fact that you have to promote yourself at all times to kind of get discovered, it's really easy to say, I'm this, right? You can beat your chest. We didn't have that growing up. So you knew you were good be um, based off of the plays you were able to make on the field um, and the amount of playing time that sometimes a coach might give you. So for that, you know, it was kind of like there was a hierarchy. Um, so I grew up, we kind of ran a wing T style offense. So it wasn't like I was going to come back and throw for 3,000 yards in a season which have been in a lot back in the nineties. I'm sorry, yeah. myself. Yes, I'm old. <laughs> um, so, so when you think about that, like, like I, I can think of my senior year, I've led the team in rushing touchdowns. I, I rushed for 17 touchdowns um, my senior year, but I also had two 1000 yard rushers um, that also had double digit touchdowns. So it goes to show you how good we were on the ground. Um, and I only threw for like eight touchdowns because we were so potent when we handed the ball off, like we could, we could get yards and chunks. Uh, and so it's just kind of understanding where you fit and how you play it um, and, and the scheme of the offense that we're in. So so a guy like Terry wasn't going to be recruited as this great receiver coming out because we didn't throw the ball a whole lot. Um, and so I knew I wasn't going to go to a house. They didn't play quarterback because we didn't throw the ball enough. We didn't throw the ball 30 times a game. That was never our game. Um, we might throw the ball 10 times most. <laughs> and that's a lot for us. So understanding that, I think we had really good um, tailbacks that came out of there. Um, again, I mentioned Wilbur Brown, who was all everything. Um, I, and I think he still might have some records. I, I want to say he rushed like 5,900 wow. plus yards. Uh, and when you look at that, so you know, coming out, like, I, I can't have an ego as this. So it's kind of like, okay, you're the man. And our coach did a really good job of making sure like, okay, your time is up. You're now, you're the leader. You have to lead this team. I, you know, as a junior, I didn't have all that pressure put on me because I had other seniors that helped me understand and carry the load. And so that was kind of the fun part about just kind of coming into it. But I think there was an aha moment. So for anybody that's trying to figure out, like, when do you decide you want to be in Division One football? Um, it starts as a freshman, right? Like, that's a mindset that you that I had early. I just didn't know what I needed to do to get to that level. Uh, and so I remember I was kind of sandbagging some 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 drills. I was kind of like not running. I kind of wasn't taking the sprints and everything. And I remember my coach came to me and said, "Listen, he's like, if you want to be the man." then you have to be the man. And I was like, well, what does that mean? You know, he's like, so, you know, if you say you're the best player, then you have to excel at everything. Like there should never be anybody that beat you in a drill. There should never be anybody that out competes you. If you say you're the fastest, then every sprint you run, you should be the first person there. Like if somebody's beating you, it should be a half a step. Like they got you because it was a slow start or, or they're just as fast as you. And so once I had that mentality shift of like, okay, if I'm supposed to be the man and I want to get to the next level, then nobody's going to outwork me then that's where that that took off. So then I and then I understood like, oh, wait a minute. Like, okay, I need to be the man uh, on this. And so I, if I'm gonna be the man, I have to show them the man in everything. It didn't matter what drill it was, I'm leading. I'm the first one out there. So as a quarterback, it didn't matter what drill it was, I'm the first one out there. I'm gonna lead by example. Uh, and so I think that helped carry on and it helped get the mentality of, okay, now I know I can play at the next level. And then it's crazy because you're the man at high school and then you get to college and everybody yeah. was the man. Right? I was going to, I was going to ask you that. So, so your junior, let's say your junior year and you start getting offers, maybe tell people what it's like to get mail at your house from, you know, different colleges. How many colleges do you remember getting mail from? Uh, what was like maybe the, the craziest place you got recruited by? We're going to get into a bunch of your recruiting stories, you know, kind of <laughs> later on in the show and other episodes, but just a general overview of what it's like to get a letter from the University of Notre Dame, University of Alabama, University of Ohio State, like addressed to you as a junior in high school. So as a junior, I, I think, so I started getting a couple letters, I want to say probably like right after the summer of my sophomore year, going into my junior year. Um, and it's just because some of those co college coaches would come to games, they'll watch stuff, they kind of scout early. Um, but it was like the local school. So it's like your capital universities, your how universities, kind of like, hey, we heard you might be a good prospect. This is general, generic. Fill out this questionnaire, we'll be watching you. Uh, and so what ended up happening for me is I had a really good junior year. We ended up going 10 and 2. As I said, we like lost one of our first games early. Then we ran off 10 straight games. Um, and, and or yes, like nine or 10 straight games, lost a game, and then went to 
um, the city championship and won that. Uh, and so it's kind of one of those things where you're like, oh, this is kind of a cool thing. And then I got recruited right after my, like the end of my junior year. I saw a huge bump into the number of letters I got. Started getting some, some again, some of those Ohio teams, Mount Union, um, Joe Flacco school. Um, so, so I got a lot of letters from them early um, just because Ohio schools recruit Ohio schools, right? Sure. And so for me, it was when I took my SAT. So anybody that's listening, take your SATs and things early, right? That's the first thing you have to do um, to make sure you, you're going to go um, and teams can recruit you because they want to make sure that they can take care of you in the classroom. So my mom, and we'll talk about some of these things in other episodes of why I did some of the things I did. But my mom had a rule of if I got anything less than a B, I couldn't play football. Ooh. So I was really good academically. I took care of what I needed to do in the class, even though, you know, some people must say, well, it's a, it's a, it's a city league school. Um, I've had some great teachers, which I'll share uh, in some of the upcoming episodes of some of my favorite teachers uh, and what they taught me and, and why that transition wasn't as difficult for me. But I passed my junior, I passed the SAT or the ACT my junior. I took my ACT because it was like, which one did you take first? Um, there was no 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 penalty for guessing. So I was like, let me take the ACT my junior year. Right so I took the spring of my junior year, got a 23, um, which I guess equates to like about probably in today's ACT, like a 26 or so, um, maybe a 27. Uh, and so I then became recruitable by all the schools because I'm like, oh, wait a minute. You have a 3.5 GPA. You already passed your ACT. You're doing well in your classrooms. Let's start recruiting this guy. Uh, and so the I world, also, the world kind of, the world kind of opened up to you. The world right? opened like up, that? and okay. I went to Ohio State's football camp. So Ohio State was right in my backyard. Like I grew up in Columbus, I could go to Ohio State's football camp anytime. So I went my junior year, um, the summer, the soft, my, like my junior year summer um, there, went there, and then my senior year I went there um, as well. So that opened up the recruiting flood. So I went from getting kind of local, um, and then it then it went to Ivy League. It went to all the military academies. And went to a few SEC schools. So I, I got letters from Tennessee um, and then Ohio State because I was in their backyard, Notre Dame uh, because, you know, I wanted to be the next Tony Rice. Uh, yeah, and there so, you go. It's so man. there was all kind of things that 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 passing the test really opened up the door for me. And so I really loved that. That was a really cool experience. And so I remember having a couple like maybe 10 letters on the wall and then all of a sudden like just opening the mailbox, going to um, football and working out. And my coach handed me a stack of mail um, because – Back then, you know, sometimes you didn't, you couldn't get the students' um, letter or their address, so they would just mail it to the school um, and to your football coach. Your football coach would hand you a stack of letters, and so he would walk in like, "Hey, you got mail?" I'm like, "Okay, cool." And they would just be like, "Hey, I think the farthest I got was UCLA. Um, I had those." So it was kind of a, just a cool time to kind of figure out what it looks like. Uh, and obviously, you just you're flattered and just like, "Wow, this is amazing." Yes, I did get one letter from Michigan. Mm. No, I did not consider going to Michigan at all. It was one of those things like, nah. <laughs> was Ohio <laughs> State was Ohio State always the dream? Ohio State was like it was like one A, one B for me. So when I knew Ohio State was in the picture, because I grew up there, like I, I want to go to Ohio State. I always went to their games, but it wasn't one of those things where I was sure if I wanted to go play there, uh, just because of the fact that. I wanted to play quarterback and I knew Ohio State like six, three guys, like 215, 220, had the crazy strong arms. Um, and that wasn't me. I'm like, all right, I'm 5'11 and a half, like on a good day with the right shoes, six foot, right? So I, I ran a 4'4, 40 coming out. Uh, and so you're like, I'm a fast guy, I'm an option guy. So I knew Notre Dame was the school that probably would be the best for me. And then watching Tony Rice, watching them win the national championship and cheering for them and, and, and watching Rocky Dismel and those guys uh, and Ricky Waters, I'm like, yeah. Jerome Bettis. Bettis. Like, like I knew that. Like I, I memorized their their Tim, their guy. Like, Brown. I had it down. Yes, Tim I, I Brown, mean, I was a, I was a Notre Dame fan. Like my freshman year, I wanted to be I wanted to go to Oklahoma, right? Okay. <laughs> and then they got the death penalty. Right? Like, no, oh yeah, no right. Oklahoma for me. No Oklahoma for me. So I'm like Notre Dame. Like I watched Notre Dame football too. So, and so then when it came down to the recruiting process, it was just kind of that game of where should I go. Uh, and Notre Dame kind of played the recruiting game, uh, and Ohio State did. Ohio State was very upfront. Um, Coach Cooper was like, "Listen, we're rebuilding. We're trying to do some things." And I was recruited as a defensive back for Ohio State. Like, so I knew if I went there, I was going to switch positions and play corner. Um, and it was something that I hadn't really done a lot yet, so I wasn't sure what that looked like for me, um, and how much playing time I might get um, if I went there. So I was just kind of like, "Let me keep my options open." Uh, and then Notre Dame kind of played the game. Ohio State was like, "You know what? We want you. We want you. We want you." Um, I got a letter at least from them once a week. 
Um, in Notre wow. Dame, like every 10 days, I would get something like, hey, we want you. We're, we're, you're on our list. Here's this. Here's that. Uh, and if I can find a picture, I, I'll send you a picture. I haven't had senior pictures with Notre Dame gear on. Um, oh, so everybody that knew me knew I was going to Notre Dame. Like they were surprised when I shot and shocked when I said I'm going to Ohio State. But anybody else in my circle kind of knew like, hey, Ohio State is definitely um, has a great shot of, of him going there. And after I took that visit and I kind of knew what it was like and I knew the atmosphere uh, and I kind of got to meet some of the players there. I'm like, you know what? This is going to be more and more the place of where I should go. And I made that decision to commit to Ohio State. And ironically, the day I committed to Ohio State, I got a phone call about an hour later from Notre Dame saying, can you come in for a visit? I'm like, nope. I just I'm, committed to Ohio State. And I'm, I'm going taken. There. That had to feel good in a way that, you know, the guys who really wanted you were the ones you committed to. We've had a lot of guests on the show, former players, you know, on If the Walls Could Talk in Buffalo, former Bills and all. Some guys really loved staying home. For, for college, Jeff Burris left South Carolina to right. go to Notre Dame because it was so opposite of, you know, how he grew up and, you know, the atmosphere around football in South Carolina. Was it easy for you to be at home? Were there a lot of like those distractions about people wanting tickets and, you know, your mom and your dad and, and all that? Like was was staying home for college? Obviously, you love Ohio State. You had a great career, but like just just a kid in college. Some, some people just want to go away and get away from all that. Well, that was that was why Notre Dame was kind of one of the schools that I was looking at because I wanted to get away. Growing up in Columbus, you want to get out of Columbus. You want to kind of spread your wings. But luckily for me, um, my my dad never was really there. Um, so, again, grew up in a single parent home. Um, so I knew who my dad was, but he lived in California. So it wasn't one of those issues of um, that. Uh, it was more of a my mom ended up uh, meeting uh, my stepdad uh, and they've been married now for, I want to say 26, 25 plus years. Um, but he was in the air force. Uh, and so when I was going through that process, she let me know, Hey, we're going to get married. As soon as you graduate, I'm getting married. Uh, so literally, literally I graduated like June the 9th um, out of high school and my mom got married like June, June 26. Uh, and so they were going to Germany because um, my, my stepdad was stationed overseas. And so then I started going through that process. OK, so does it make sense to even consider leaving Columbus where I have some family and a support network and then going to a school that I had no no one? Uh, there's nobody there. If there's an issue, I don't have anybody I can call. And so that helped make the decision of why Ohio State was a, a little bit more, maybe a better fit. Um, when I started looking at the big scheme of things, uh, my mom left, my twin brother left. So it was just me and I had okay. my family still here. And so I knew that I had the campus, my, bu my bubble there on campus with my, my football brothers. But if I needed anything, I also had family that I could call. I could call my aunt who lives literally 10 minutes from the campus. So I could be like, hey, I, I need this or I need that. Or, hey, can you come get me? I need such and such. And so that really helped weigh into the decision of why or how it ended up being a better decision for me. Yeah, that's really interesting. Like you kind of had the best of both worlds, right? Like, right. you know, God love your mom. God love my mom. But I was a little, I was kind of ready to get away from my mom and my dad. Right. You I'm know, like, bye, mom. Bye. bye. Yeah, it's, yeah, right. She's like, should you come? You should come with me. That mom, that's not happening. Like, but she's, she's the one who ride. Ride. Did you, um, did you seriously consider any of the service academies? For a minute I did. Yeah. I considered, um, I, Air Force, I remember getting that recruiting call from uh, back in the force. Back in the day, Air Force had a really good quarterback named D. Dallas, uh, and he was in the Heisman talk. Uh, and so I remember watching their offense and running how they um, watch how they run it. And I remember he called me. And he was like, hey, um, this is D. Dallas. I'm like, oh, I know who you are. Like, I know exactly who you are. Uh, and so we had a really good conversation. But I had always wanted to go to the NFL. Like, that was my dream to play in the NFL. And back then, uh, you had this really crazy – commitment of i think it's now two years but i want to say back when i was coming out it might have been three or four and so it was a very long commitment of you couldn't go to the info you had a service commitment that you had to fulfill and so that was one of the biggest reasons as to why i said you know i was going to follow that process through i'm like why would i why would I even kid myself that's not even fair because i know i wouldn't even want that if i became really good at football and i got to the level of where i think i can get that's going to set me back and I'm, I'm not even going to go that route. So I just decided not to follow that path. I considered some of the Ivy League schools again, but then it was like, OK, Ohio State, Notre Dame, like you can get the same quality education um, that way. So I was like, yeah, I'm good there. I'm going here. Uh, and Ohio State ended up being the final choice for me. I think I think David Robinson was probably the only guy who was able to be, you know, right. get that, that service, uh, that service commitment kind of commuted because he's future Hall of Famer. You'd have been a great option quarterback at any one of those service schools, though. 
I would have loved it. It would have been fun, like to go to Navy and beat Notre Dame. <laughs> oh well, well, that's so you know, ouch, ahead. ouch. Yeah, that was <laughs> ouch. That was well played. So you know, as as the show goes forward, we're going to continue to kind of monitor or in, follow with with Marlon's journey here. I guess we'll kind of leave it there for your journey. You know, kind of deciding on Ohio State. We want to get into like what it was like on campus. You know, all the rest. I think we're going to transition right now and kind of talk about the 2023 Buckeyes. And I'd like to week by week kind of have you share uh, what it's like being an athlete, you know, before week one. Uh, and then maybe some of the Big Ten schools that, you know, Ohio State plays every year. Uh, we're going to mirror their schedule as we go. We're obviously going to talk about Notre Dame as well. We're going to talk about, you know, the big picture college football. I know you're really excited for a game Thursday night that we can talk about before we go tonight. But I'm going to put up the schedule now for Ohio State for week one. Everybody can see. And, uh, you know, they open – with the juggernaut of the Indiana Hoosiers uh, at home, a perennial speed bump for the Buckeyes from what I've seen. Uh, what what recollections do you have of playing Indiana, either home or away? And, you know, just talk me through what it's like to open a college football season. You know, it, it's such a, a fun thing to do. And, and normally you don't see um, Ohio State open opponent. Uh, generally you try to get uh, somebody like, Western Kentucky that's on the schedule the following week or a Youngstown State or a Bowling Green. You try to get some of those schools. Um, but I think for scheduling purposes, you got um, Indiana. So ironically, um, as I shared some of those uh, recruiting stories, Indiana was the first school that I took an official visit to. Uh, and so Bloomington was like the first place I went inside in the middle of nowhere. Uh, so I never lost a game uh, to Indiana uh, in my four years playing at Ohio State. We always played them, we beat them. Um, Ohio State has, ironically, when you think about this matchup, um, when we talk about the tail of the tape, if you were going to be a boxer, um, right? Ohio State has a 28-game win streak against Indiana right now. Um, they've won wow. the last 10. Um, they beat them last year, 56-14 to 14 at home. When they went to Indiana two years ago, they beat them 54-7. to 7. So it's not like Ohio State is fretting this right now. I think for Buckeye fans, what you want to think about for this game is you had some changeover, right? You, you lost some offensive linemen. You lost C.J. Stroud. You have a lot of weapons coming back. So what you're looking for is who's going to be starting quarterback. You're kind of, you know, you have by September 23rd, you have a huge game coming up that we will talk about here in the coming weeks. Yes, um, we will. At Notre Dame. At yes, Notre we Dame. will. Right. And so when you look at this game, you're trying to come in and really kind of set who you are, set your identity as a football team. You're going to kind of show one that Travion Henderson is healthy. So you want to get him going. You got Mayan Williams. I'm back there. So you got a juggernaut um, backfield and you're loaded with three guys that played a lot last year that you're going to be able to hand the ball to everybody in Bills fans. If you are a Bills friend from back in the day, we all know who Marvin Harrison was uh, when the Colts were in the AFC East division with us and how they set all kind of records. They torched us. But his son is also a pretty good football player um, at the Ohio State University. There's Marvin talk Harrison of him Jr. being like there's talk of him being like a top two pick next year, him and right. Caleb Williams. Like he's easily top five in the country right now. Easily you know. top five. Um, and so you have a lot of weapons. You have some incoming guys that play. You got, uh, there's so many weapons that Ohio State has. So one, what you're trying to do is figure out who's going to be the starting quarterback. That has not been decided. At least the last time I checked Twitter um, and looked at any Ohio State news, it hasn't been decided. I've been in those situations in my own experience of where some coaches will say, you know what, they just haven't separated from each other yet. So we're going to go with a two quarterback style of system and kind of give them an opportunity to see if one separates against the bullets in, in live action, because no matter how much you practice and go blitz tempo situations, you really can't simulate game speed. You just kind of have to see how people react in game situations. So I could, I could see Ohio State coming into this game in the, in the next few games after that saying we're going to give them equal opportunity, kind of give them on a pitch count and see who does well and see if you can get them in certain situations to kind of get them prepared for what they're going to face when they go to South Bend and play. So, so I can no see that happening. No coach would ever admit this, and you'll never get a player on record <laughs> in an interview to admit this. This is almost like a three-game preseason for, for Ohio State, right? I wouldn't call it a preseason uh, because those teams are going to come in and compete. I mean, but sure. when you look at the talent level, of what's there if Ohio State takes care of business and actually focuses and says we're going to treat this um the way and play the way we can play they should win those games they will be favors I, I want to say I think the line is Ohio State is 97 percent um favored yeah. to win at Indiana right so if you go and take care of business um anything you know you, you should win this game but what you're trying to do is really kind of get into a rhythm 
right? So at, whoever the quarterback's going to be, can you get, get into a rhythm? Can you get your receivers going? Can you get your run game going? Because you want to build confidence. You want to build continuity. You hear that term a lot in football. We just want to build continuity. Uh, and so you haven't been able really to do that. Sometimes you hold guys out of practice. Sometimes you kind of go back and just like he's got dinged up and I want to see how it is. And some guys are just freshmen. They're coming freshmen. They haven't played at this level yet. So you want to get them the exposure that they need. So I'm looking forward to seeing what they do. Um, and this is a good test. I'm a good Big Ten opponent, so it matters. So you're really going to take it serious because it matters in the division. It matters um, if you want to get to the goal of playing for the Big Ten championship. You need to win this game. Does Indiana have any sort of home field advantage? I mean, I'm assuming it's probably, what, 50% Buckeye fans? I mean, they'll have some people there. I mean, but yes, it's close enough for us to travel. Buckeye fans always travel well. So, you know, you'll see a, a, a sea of red there. I mean, and they have their maroon or burgundy, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but I, I think this is a game where they know going into it that Ohio State should win this game. So, you know, if you're the opposing coach, you're trying to talk and like, look, we're the underdog. Like nobody expects us to win. The pressure's all on them. And that's what he's saying. That's what he's trying to get them to understand. Like the pressure's on them. Like if they can't figure it out, if their quarterback can't read the defense, we have a good shot. If we can keep it close, they get more and more tight. And so that's where you see some of those games early where it matters um, for teams. Where do you want to try to get going? They want to get their offense moving. They just want to try to get scores. You really what you want when we talk about continuity early is I want to sustain drops. It's not one of those. I want home run. I want shots. I want to be able to string together a 10 play, a 12 play, a 15 play drive, because now that means I'm executing. And that's going to bode well for later in the season. Uh, and, and again, you know, Ohio State has the athletes where they should be able to exploit some of those holes in the secondary that Indiana might have. They should have be, have some running backs that can take and have home run speed and breakaway speed. So there's going to be opportunities where they can do that. Um, against Indiana. Uh, and then, you know, they come back the following week at home. They have two home games um, in Youngstown State and Washington. Um, yeah, a real gauntlet. Western Kentucky, real, yeah. Western Kentucky, a, yeah. That's a real a gauntlet. gauntlet. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, just looking at the schedule, uh, just a brief overview, you know, Indiana, Youngstown State, Western Kentucky, obviously the big game against Notre Dame, you know, then Maryland, Purdue, Penn State. If you're like when you were in college, did you guys do the, oh, that's a win, that's a win, that's a loss, or that's a tough game, not a loss. But, like, did you – like, do the players know, hey, you know what, we're going to – if we line up and we play well, we're going to beat Youngstown State, we're going to beat Western Kentucky. Did you guys look ahead? I mean, you're college kids. How could you not? We're college kids. I mean, yeah, I mean, there, there's a tendency to come in and look like, yeah, we should win this game. Um, but then you also look at what, – what we also like to do is, like, okay, who from this is considered to be – a prospect, a pro level prospect, because I want this measuring stick. So, you know, if you're playing a team like we played Fresno State one year uh, and Trent Dilfer was the was the quarterback and you're like, OK, if we're going to play Trent Dilfer, all right, he's like a pro style quarterback. I want to make sure that I try to knock some passes down. I want to try to get interceptions. So you look at those things. You look at the schedule of what's the matchup? Who can I go? Who projected to possibly get drafted? Who's this person going here? Um, do they run a pro scheme? Like, how can I show that I can play against this person? How can I go and show that I'm better than this person to kind of solidify what I'm doing um, so that when I eventually say I want to go to the NFL, then can I do that? And so you kind of look at those matchups and you know, like, we don't like Michigan. We know that's the last game. You look at the Michigan State game. You look at that Penn State game. Those are games you know there's going to be a dogfight. So, you know, like, I need to bring my A game. I need to be focused on those games. And so, you know, you're always looking at those, how to match up, how I'm going to play, how, what's my mindset going to be, what is it going to look like, and you're watching the schedule for them too. That's really interesting that you find, like, individual matchups. It's like the old Michael Jordan thing, right? Like, he would always find some motivation even against an inferior opponent. You know, maybe they didn't draft him, or maybe some dude looked at him the wrong way in the locker room or on the bus, or, you know, right. five years ago something happened. So that's interesting that you would – kind of use like Trent Dilfer as a measuring stick and to put on tape, you know, for, for the NFL. I, I had never really thought of it that way. I think that's, that's pretty interesting. On the, on the flip side, Notre Dame this week coming off a big win against Navy, uh, the Sam Hartman bowl, I'd like to call it four touchdowns. Great, great start to the season. They play uh, Tennessee state, which is a, a significant game for Notre Dame. It's the first time that they've ever uh, hosted an FCS opponent. And it's the first time they've ever hosted a, a historically black a university. And the head coach is someone who obviously you're familiar with and Eddie George. Maybe can you talk to us a little bit about Eddie George as a player and as a friend and then, you know, him as a coach? As a coach, I'm not too familiar with him. I haven't spoken with him in a little while, but as a player, I, I just remember um, he was kind of quiet, um, kind of coming in. Uh, he went to uh, a, a military school. Um, so he kind of went to that prep school and then kind of came in early 
onto Ohio State. So highly touted coming out. Big dude, 6'4", like 225, uh, solid kid. Like So you come and you look at him. And I just remember him, the work, his work ethic. Um, we were there. Like, we all worked hard. Uh, we used to have this thousand pound club that we would kind of come in um, that you could get on a leaderboard. And so uh, for us to be a part of the thousand pound club, you had to have, it was either bench press or squat uh, and lunges um, or hand clean. Um, so that was kind of the four things you could do to be a part of the thousand, thousand pound club. Um, yes, I did get in a thousand pound club, nice. um, by the way. So, so yes, yeah, so we kind of looked at those things. Uh, and so I just remember Eddie going through uh, and we always had really good running backs at Ohio state. So from, uh, Carlos Snow to Robert Smith to Raymond Harris uh, to Butler Benote, uh, guys that made it to the some some of those guys made it to the next level, some guys didn't. And then Eddie um, had the Eddie was really good about biding his time. Uh, and I just remember him one year he kind of had a two fumble game that we ended up losing um, in Illinois. And I remember just the crowd going at it, uh, and I remember him just being quiet, not saying too much about it. And then he came back the next year. He worked. I mean, he worked so hard. And so he turned that uh, into a Heisman Trophy year, uh, the following in '95, uh, and then had a great pro career. And now he's the head coach. Uh, and I mean, just a guy who's going to have those guys in right, doing everything right. And I think that's the thing that I love about it. And so I love the fact that you have a, a Buckeye head coach who was able to connect with another former Buckeye who's the head coach in Notre Dame and, and Freeman uh, and kind of saying, let's do some things. Let's, let's get us on the schedule. Let's, let's get these guys the exposure um, that they need. Uh, and again, it's going to, it's not like it's going to be a dog fight. I, I think, you know, going into it, Eddie knows that talent wise, Notre Dame is going to be light years ahead of where Tennessee um, state is. But again, at the same thing, it's one of those things like this is great exposure for the program, great exposure for him. Uh, and it's a measuring stick for the talent of guys so they can kind of see what it's like. Because the one thing I always tell people when people ask me, like, you know, what school should I go to? You go where you have the best opportunity because the NFL will always find you. <laughs> so yeah. it doesn't matter what school you went to. You can go uh, to any school that there is. I mean, you know, Division three, Division two, one double A or FCS. Now, it doesn't matter if you can play football. The NFL is going to find you. The only thing that matters is, is how you come into it. You might get drafted depending on what school and what division you went to. Um, or you may become an und un undrafted free agent, but it doesn't matter if you have talent, you can play, you're going to have an opportunity to so just get there um, and the rest will take care of itself. We've interviewed, you know, we're going to wrap up here in a minute. We've interviewed so many guys who played for the Bills on the Super Bowl teams. Don Beebe, you know, uh, uh, Jamie Mueller went to some place called Benedictine in Kansas. And this is like the late 80s where right. they were still finding these guys. So you're right. Like, obviously, with social media and every game's on TV now, if you can play, you can play. And they'll find you because each NFL you know team has how many scouts? God only knows what twenty, you know every scouting department. So they'll they'll right. find you. That's really that's really good advice that you give to a kid that go play. Like you'd rather you'd probably rather be the starter on a team like that than like you know fourth string at Ohio State in some ways, right? Yes, yes, and I think we'll talk about that in one of the episodes about the portal um, and how it kind of changes things. But I mean, that's kind of the reason why I tell like, man, it doesn't matter. Like, why be a walk on if somebody wants you and they're at FCS or Division two? They still give out scholarships in Division Two. You can still go to you can go to school for free at Division Two schools, and have the same exposure uh, and, and do some things. So it doesn't matter. Just go there and play and have the best opportunity to grow as a football player, and everything else will take care of itself. We're gonna we're gonna do two more things here before we uh, wrap it up for episode one. You told me uh, you're you're kind of the game you're looking forward to the most. I'd like to uh, you know basically highlight one game a week that's not Notre Dame or Ohio State. So uh, you maybe tell people the game that you're looking forward to the most this week and why. So I'm looking forward to seeing this SEC Pac-12 matchup that's actually going to be on ESPN um, on Thursday between the 14th ranked Utah Utes um, and the Florida Gators. So I just like to see that matchup. Um, Utah Pac-12 champion knocked off USC last year, uh, finished up with a 10-4 and record. Uh, and so Florida, not so great of a record, but, you know, I'm looking forward to just kind of seeing what that looks like. That's the game that stands out to me this week. Like this could be interesting because Florida's not ranked. And you always hear about the SEC. And when you look at the top 25, I want to say there's like five or six teams right now that are in the Big Ten, that are in the SEC. So from a, from a top 25 standpoint, you've got a lot of teams that represent those two conferences. So I'm just really looking forward to seeing. And I think I want to say there's like maybe four or five Pac-12 uh, 
people in that as well. So it's going to be fun to watch and just kind of see what it looks like. And it's on ESPN. It's the, that Thursday night game, kind of your can't miss TV kind of kicks off that college football weekend. And I think it's going to be fantastic and see what Utah can do um, and if they can win it. And Florida's traveling on the road and that's a tough environment. So I really want to see what Utah can do and if Florida can shake off that six and seven record that they had last year. It's kind of always fun to see the SEC schools actually like travel outside the Southeast of the United States, right? Like what's it? Alabama has some ridiculous stat where they, where they have played like North of the Mason Dixon line, like three times in the last 20 years. Like it's something crazy like that, where they always seem to have everybody either come to them or play neutral site. So, you know, I kind of applaud Florida for going to Utah. Utah's probably a, a tough place to play. And ironically enough, it's the urban Meyer bowl. <laughs> yes, that, that is where Florida. Urban Meyer started there, went to Florida, and then went to Ohio State. So it's kind of it's kind of that whole circle of Urban Meyer, the ties that, that binds all three schools. So it's going to be fun to watch. I, I can't wait um, as, as a Buckeye fan. And ironically, I'll give a shameless plug to my cousin if you might listen to this. Um, he also went to the University of Florida, was a seven-time All-American in track um, there. So I, we have a lot of ties that go along. Um, with that so i'm just looking forward to watching that game in particular um and and it's kind of the first weekend now where there's always football on so we'll have um some college football on and then just start going the following week nfl kicks off so i mean it's a it's a football delight for me i'll get to watch college and pro ball um and there's always a, a, a plethora of games a lot so i'm looking forward to it did you watch swamp kings i did watch swamp kings it was pretty cool um and and we talked about that a little bit uh earlier yep. and and i misspoke um, and that was at 06, like, yeah, when they they beat us and we were we were not supposed to um, lose that game, but they manhandled us. So, yeah, so it was kind of uh, hard to relive that, that, sure. that highlight, but interesting. That was an interesting documentary. This is like the greatest weekend of the year. You know, full disclosure, my wife and my boys, or twin boys that are 10, I'll talk about them, you know, on the show from time to time. They love camping. We have a camper. And uh, my wife and I compromise. She always gets Memorial Day and Columbus Day. And I always get 4th of July and Labor Day at home in our backyard uh, to, to watch college football. Because typically that's the Notre Dame opener. Obviously, this year was a little different with the week zero. But, man, like the opening weekend of college football, even though the game, the slate is not always great. There's always a couple of you know neutral site games or whatever. But, man, it's so exciting that like it's back. And you can sit down at, at 9 a.m. on a Saturday morning put college game day on and just sit there until 10 o'clock at night and just like never move. It's the best. It's the best. One of the things we need to do is we need to tailgate because I, I I have to admit, as always playing football, I've never really tailgated. So never do one of these shows. No, I've never tailgated. Um, It's always been a player. Like you don't get to do those things. Even after playing uh, every time I've never really just sat and said, let's do the whole full experience and going out hours beforehand. I've done those show up for like an hour. We're kind of going to do this. Um, but never the full experience. So anybody listening, um, call me. We'll we'll go to a Bills game and do it, or yeah. we'll kind of come to an Ohio State game or a college game um, and do that. Well, I can I can I can hook us up for the Bills uh, aspect of it. My wife actually shares season tickets with uh, two of my closest friends. Uh, I don't go because I go to my buddy's house who has the man cave with the seven TVs. So I'd rather watch every game rather than just the Bills game on Sunday. But we will definitely make that uh, that October 1st against the Dolphins. Uh, I think we're all going to go. So that one, we can give you the full tailgate experience. We got somebody staying in a camper all, uh, all weekend. So they're going to park it. in the camper lot and do that. That'd be, that'd be a great That'd time. Be awesome. That would be awesome. That, that would be awesome. So we're going to, we're going to leave it there for episode one. I hope everybody enjoyed it. We're going to get into so many more stories and memories that Marlon has of, of his journey, his career, and obviously a bunch of guests and, and fun, you know, fun stuff going forward. Any, any final thoughts, Marlon? I would just say, I hope you guys like this episode. Uh, it's something that we're, we want to explore. So the one thing that you can do for us, um, if you really liked um, what you li- what you heard today, just give us a like um, so that we can kind of get into your playlist, drop in often so you can hear us, and then give us some feedback. Tell us, hey, Marlon, I don't like when you hold your head this way, or hey, Marlon, you talk too much about Ohio State, or hey, Marlon, take it easy on Notre Dame. They're not that bad. <laughs> uh, you know, we didn't even get into that team up north and the trouble that they're going through with their coach, um, which we'll talk about on another episode. But for you know, sure, topics that you want to talk about, let us know, and we'll definitely try to make sure we cover it. 
Absolutely, clearly Marlon's coachable. Uh, I've I've you know been humbled over the last year getting feedback from the other show that I'm on. Uh, like and subscribe, please. Uh, this episode was brought to you by Family Care Physical Therapy. Uh, my buddy owns it. It's, there's three physical therapy clinics in the uh, Buffalo region. He takes great care of his patients. Thank you to him for his support and make the show possible. Thanks to the guys on Cover One uh, for being gracious enough to let us uh, host the show on here. And uh, hopefully everybody will tune in next week. See you, Marlon. See you.